the speakers who asked for no change to be made were of a group who feared that they or people like them could be harmed. The people who spoke on the other side, um, by and large, were not going to be harmed if they got their way. And um, so, you guys know I'm a history teacher, or I have been in the past. Um, anytime, and I think this is a pretty, really safe statement to make, anytime people with no skin in the game legislate something that affects other people, yes. it turns out badly. Yes. Like that is just. So, uh, in continuing to say things that don't need to be said, but apparently do, um, we do not believe parents are bad. Um, there are parents on both sides of this issue, it turns out. There's not like one group of parents who get to claim the mantle of all parents, okay? Um, we don't hate parents. We don't try to keep secrets from parents. We want parents involved in every possible safe way. Four of us up here are or have been mandated reporters. We understand that there are times, rare times, but very real times, when informing a parent about something going on in a child's life at school is dangerous. We are legally responsible to have that knowledge and act on it appropriately. And this just seems to um, fly in the face of that. Um, then I'm going to keep coming back to is uh, 7%. Not 7%, sorry. Um, I was doing some digging. Um, seven out of every 1,000 students in California have at some point a substantiated uh, claim of neglect or abuse that has to be reported under camera. I mean, that's seven, seven is, you know, it's small, but it's real. Those are people who are being harmed. And I just don't understand how anybody can hear all this testimony that if you do this, people will be harmed and not be moved by that. Um, We had an interesting, well, let me see. Sorry, let me collect my thoughts for a second. Um, if we were to adopt a policy which required school staff to out students under any circumstances, and a student was harmed because of that, we would both likely be liable and we would carry that with us forever. Yes. And that is not a thing that, I, that, that I'm willing to live with. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll return to our original motion on the table, which is to retain the current policy, 5145.3, as it's currently written, okay. um, unless or until case law or legislative act, sorry, legislative action provides further direction for changes. Any other discussion? Okay, well, since I made the motion, I'm gonna start. So, Dalby, aye. Robinson, aye. Konkin, nay. Lando, aye. Tennis, nay. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Claire Mossman and I'm a sophomore at Pleasant Valley High School. Last September, about four weeks into the school year, I was shocked and embarrassed to learn that I had been tricked into taking my clothes off while sharing a locker room with a male student. I was very upset and extremely confused. I didn't understand how my school could do this to me. 
I am a Christian girl, and I would never choose to take my clothes off in front of a boy. That boy is using my locker room at your invitation, and you didn't give, even give me a warning or an alternative option. All I got was forced compliance. It could be any male in that locker room watching us undress. It doesn't matter who the guy is. He does not belong in my locker room. Now, I have guys right next to me in the girls' bathroom. How could you ever believe that this is okay? This is, this is the girls' bathroom. I have been to a few of these meetings now, and it is apparent to me that you are not at all considering how it affects everyone involved. My dad called the school this week to complain about my experience with boys in my bathroom. He talked to a vice principal about it, so later that day, she called me into the office, and in so many words, I was told that if being compromised and violated was a problem for me, that I could walk clear across campus to the single-use bathroom up front. Otherwise, too bad, it wasn't my problem, it's the law. What about all the other girls in the same situation as me? Are we all going to walk to the front of the school being late for class, risking being, getting in trouble just to be able to feel safe and honor our values when there's a bathroom right down the hall? You continue to say that you're here to serve the students and families in this district. However, it seems that that only applies to a select group of people. You have violated my privacy, you have violated my modesty, and you have violated my dignity. To other parents and adults in this room, please, we need your help. It is not just me. I have had countless other girls and guys as well come to me with their feelings and concerns about being violated the way we are. The entire student body is under assault and the school board and administration are the ones assaulting us. Thank you. That was my girl. <laughs> um, I had a... <clears throat> I, I, you know, I, I wrote down some angry things. I'm seething inside. Um, some less than kind things. But, you know, last week was just obscene. It was ridiculous. We had a huge contingency in here from the Alphabet Mafia. And uh, one of them sitting right in front of that girl sitting beside me, turning around once he realized that she was with me and after he realized that I'd spoken, constantly turned around, glaring at her for uncomfortable periods of time, just on purpose. He's early, late, or mid, late 20s, guy wearing a dress, glaring at my daughter, trying to intimidate her and threaten her. We had a professor from Chico State University here, stood here and said some horrible things, and went home and proclaimed herself queer as in F-U, and then implied that she was going to shoot anybody that disagreed with her. Lindsey Briggs, you're going to need to shoot somebody. Go ahead and start with me. I'm a lot older than a lot of parents, and their kids need them to be around a little bit. Lindsey, you're just a very fine step away from going from a pretend victim to a very real murderer. This, 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 this got to get dialed back. You all know, all five of you know, regardless of what your agenda is, and I know at least three of you have agendas that are completely contrary to my own. Mine is about the kids. Yours are very specific about modifying our society. And um, we know what's going on right now is not right. It's not right. There are solutions, but they're going to take some time and some thinking and a little bit of money. But our kids are worth this. And we've got to dial back the rhetoric. Parents need to get more involved. And um, we need to be in this for our children. We need to be in this for our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my heart just breaks for that family. Um, at the last meeting, uh, Mr. Lando said that he wanted to know why there is a persistent idea that parents think their children are being coerced into changing genders. He said, quote, it's clearly not true. No one is in a classroom telling students who they ought to be. He went on to say in reference to those of us who spoke against the district secrecy policy, quoting again, the people who spoke on the other side by and large were not going to be harmed if they got their way. Anytime people with no skin in the game 
legislate something that affects other people, it turns out badly. Perhaps, Mr. Lando, you've forgotten about the federal lawsuit that has been brought against this board and the district because a parent was not informed of a social transition that was happening to her daughter. This happened within the elementary school and the classroom, proving that it is in fact true. At the mere mention of a gender question, the student was told who she ought to be. Aurora Regino and her family were indeed harmed by the district's dangerous policy of keeping secrets. Harm that could very well come to many more families because you voted to keep this policy. I have a lot of skin in the game. I have a child within this district. Every single person with a child, family member, or friend within this district has skin in the game. Those of us who want parental inclusion are not asking for something that affects other people. We're asking for a policy that directly affects everyone. Mr. Lando, you went on to say that we do not believe parents are bad. We don't hate parents. We don't, want, we don't keep secrets from parents. We want parents involved. Then please tell me why you voted against a parent inclusion policy. I've had some great conversations with staff members of this district, and most can understand that parents want inclusion. I can understand that a child might feel nervous or cautious about telling a parent that they're questioning their identity. But what I would expect staff to do is to tell that child, let me help you tell your parent. I understand this could be hard for you, but I'm here to help you. Understand that parents are the ones that can help them the best. This conversation isn't over, and I hope this board will see this and revise this policy before you have more lawsuits on your hands. Rob Berry and then Loretta Torres. Well, I'm sorry, Tom, but you're going to be picked on a little bit more here. Uh, we witnessed many rude and uncivil things at this last meeting. And um, it is ironic that those who argue that students must be shielded from their parents in the interest of pre preventing harassment, intimidation, and discrimination showed themselves to be the most shameless and worst offenders. But of all of the misguided and offensive words and conduct we witnessed, none can top the words of Tom Lando, spoken after midnight in justifying his reasons for voting in favor of the parental secrecy policy. What he said is that the only harm that exists are those declaring themselves transgender children and what he called outing children to their parents because the parents had no skin in the game, as you just heard. And that the only policy that he could live with is the one that he voted for, which is to maintain a policy of student privacy over parent, uh, parents being informed. I warned you last meeting about the legal risks you were exposing yourself to, and that the Regino case is only the beginning. These cases are being brought all over the country, and circuit courts are finding that the rights of parents reign supreme, despite state laws, guidance, or district orthodoxy. But the majority are not persuaded by these arguments. You are not persuaded by any argument except those justifying interventions in the most sacred and defensible principles of family life, the right of parents to intervene in all aspects of a child's rearing. It is the parents' genes that the children carry, not yours or anyone else's. Children are the skin that parents have in this game. My advice to you is this. Don't think for a minute that simply by making a speech or by casting a vote on the dais, you can override the authority of parents in their children's lives. We still live in a constitutional republic and you are forcing parents to prove that to you. And trust me, they will. I'm an 80-year-old grandmother with two in your school district at this time. I was taught to love my fellow man and not to judge whatever journey they chose in this life. And because of that, I used to volunteer at Safe Space. 
Our meetings were held at Stonewall Alliance's offices on Broadway. I was supportive of Stonewall's work with transgender adults and gays who were harassed or mistreated by the public and who needed help. That was 14 years ago. Now, Stonewall has morphed into student support groups on your campus, distributing breast binders and information to children with working, draw and working, wording and drawings to help them with their confusion as early as pre-K. You wouldn't accept Bible study groups on your campus who distributed children's Bibles. So why Stonewall? I think you've become jaded because you've seen your fair share of uncaring parents, ones who you never see until their graduation night, if then. Parents who've changed their baby's diapers, nursed them through illnesses, worried when they, pa they were past their curfew as teens. These are loving parents. They are not your en their enemy. They are not the enemy here. I repeat, parents are not the enemy. Loving parents deserve the benefit of the doubt from you and the school's counselors. They are not getting it, and your vote two weeks ago reflected this. I think you're waiting for California to pass AB 665 so parents will be coerced to agree to transgender affirmative or affirmation treatment. Stonewall has been influencing our children to demand puberty blocking drugs and testosterone treatment and more importantly, to not wait until they are sure of their choices. So many teachers are afraid to speak their minds on this issue. I think if you allowed teachers to take an anonymous vote about keeping secrets from their students' parents on this vital issue, you would be shocked at their opinions on this. Now, all you parents listening or watching tonight, you should be afraid, very afraid of Bill AB 665. It's making its way through our democratic-controlled legislature, and if passed, it will make it possible for counselors to decide whether your child should be taken from you if you don't give your permission to their children's gender affirmation. God have mercy on all of you if you don't protect the most vulnerable and innocent children in your care. Thank you. Hi, my name is Deanna Lindstrom. And I was one of the 40 speakers at the last school board meeting who spoke up because schools should not be keeping secrets from parents. I know firsthand what kind of destruction secrecy can cause. Our children spend half of their waking hours at these schools to get an education while parents like myself work to support their needs. Our children may experience bullying and harassment while at school. And according to Chico Stonewall Alliance's Facebook page, 82% of children experience this at school and not at home like you want us to believe. How dare a board member who sits before us have the audacity to say, and I quote, parents have no skin in this game. Let me let you in on a little secret. We do have skin in the game when our hearts beat and walk outside of our bodies. And all we want is for our children to be loved, nurtured, and not feel any kind of anguish. Why would you want to keep what our children are going through from us? Why do you want our children to suffer from any kind of hardships without the help of parents? It should be a team effort across the board to help children learn and grow into healthy adults. The last board meeting became out of control with yelling, mocking, and hatred towards parents who just want more transparency between the school and families. Why are you condoning this behavior towards parents? Why are our children being told not to confide in their parents for emotional support? Isn't that the opposite of what fam family dynamics is really about? This is a huge problem and is exactly why parents are now holding the schools and district accountable. Thank you. At the April 5th meeting, we saw school board president Dalby refuse to recite the Pledge of Allegiance and completely fail in her duties to run a civil and safe meeting on school grounds. Stonewall Alliance bullies attended to boo, jeer, and interrupt speakers who wanted transparency with parents. This board, minus trustees Konkin and Dennis, Tennis, approved the secrecy policy with zero evidence that parents would be abusive toward their children upon hearing sensitive information. Last night's city 
State Council meeting had a lone Socialist Council member also refusing to recite the pledge. He also participated in disrespectful behavior, such as Dalby has, and droned on for most topics, which ensured some of the public weren't heard, as for the second time they didn't get through an agenda. Had they done so, it likely would have been an eight-hour meeting like the one here on April 5th. The complete lack of civility and control in these public meetings, plus the painfully obvious, obvious bias shown by Robinson, Dalby, and Lando, who laughably claimed parents don't have any skin in the game, that condescension is replicated by their comrade on the council and highlights the combined utter lack of regard you socialists show to anyone who doesn't share your extremist ideologies. Example, a speaker admonished parents that social transitioning shouldn't be confused with medical transitioning. First off, breast binders are suggested and provided to minor girls on campus without being advised of risk and without parental knowledge. Dr. John Stever, assistant professor of pediatrics at Mount Sinai, who runs his transgender health program said, most of his patients who use binders then tell me the next things they wanna do, like testosterone, mastectomy, and maybe phalloplasty. 95% of the people I've evaluated get started on cross hormones. So I'm pretty sure we parents are right to want transparency from the get-go and that social transition is a gateway to medical transition. Get real. The room was a complete circus for several meetings now, and we can all clearly see who the children would not be safe with, and it clearly is not us parents. Last night, after the council meeting, one bully made sure to catch me leaving and called out meanly, how about that last school board meeting and hearing about how much your son hates you? You were a mess. Do you get how toxic you all are? And yet you want us to allow you unfettered access to our minor children. You are the bullies. You are those who are filled with hatred and bigotry. There is zero evidence here locally of any of your accusations and assumptions that we the parents are bullies. You are the last people who should serve as role models or support to impressionable young minors. There is a black hole in many of you which is only matched by your cold black hearts. You've lost your moral compass, your compassion, and your objectivity. You don't understand the Constitution, the Brown Act, ethics trainings, or what it means to abide by your oaths of office. So That's your time. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Ed <clears throat> I wanted to share my observations from the last board meeting. Um, the parents focused their comments on the secrecy policy. If they referenced the trans community at all, they made neutral or supportive remarks. They listened respectfully to the teachers they didn't agree with. Outburst, outbursts were limited to defensive comments like stop interrupting or let them speak. I also observed that the trans activist community seemed triumphant. They outnumbered the parents and employed thunderous applause and booing and catcalls to create a fairly intimidating environment. Therefore, it seemed odd that they felt the need to respond to parents with mocking and ridicule. Particular targets of their derision were comments about parents' rights deriving from nature, nature's God, the Constitution, that sort of thing. The ridicule seemed to be directed at the parents' values. One pointed example was a mother sobbing before the community, clearly mourning the break with her child who was present and in agony because she could not affirm choices she believed would lead to harm. The activist community had no empathy or compassion for this person, but only more ridicule and derision, apparently because they disagreed with her sincerely held beliefs and the actions they led her to. We have a name for this hostility directed toward people because of their values, culture, or religious belief. It's called bigotry. And actions to intimidate, hurt, punish, or silence we call bullying. As if to ensure that this was the only conclusion a reasonable person could reach, Lindsay Briggs, the wife of Andrea Mox, the director of Stonewall, followed up the meeting with an online posting celebrating the evening's success and punctuating, the, punctuating it with a cartoon depicting a woman pointing a gun and quoting, not gay as in happy, but queer as in F you, that's not what it said. Message received. So my observation was that the activist community centered around Stonewall is objectively hateful, cruel, bigoted, and prone to merciless bullying. Question, why would any parent, school board, or school district superintendent want people like that around their children? I don't believe they would. Therefore, I am committing myself to systematically sharing my observations with the Chico community as a warning against Stonewall and trans activism, together with the facts about misdiagnosis and the collapse of Tavistock, among other relevant topics. I have already started. I'll also say, since it seemed to have a little time left, um, 
I think that the concept of an adolescent sharing information to a counselor in secret and not having that shared with anybody is probably defensible. But what is not defensible is the idea that everybody in the school would be notified by that counselor or parent or teacher and not the parent. That's not defensible. What is also not defensible is the idea that an eight-year-old is going to share something that, that, that's not going to be shared with their parent. If someone, if a school representative doesn't think that a parent can hear what an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old or a ten-year-old has to say, then they should file charges against the parent. Otherwise, it's ridiculous. So just wanted to clarify. That's your time. Thank you.